I want to be married, and I think I'm ready. I say I'm ready. But is it possible that God is doing a work in me and strengthening me and making me better and strengthening my foundation to prepare me for when I am in that season of having a wife? Welcome back to episode 113 of the What's It Up podcast, the place where we answer the most viral questions about Catholic life. I'm your host, Pete Dill. As always, thank you so much for being here with me today. Whether you're watching this, listening to this, however you are consuming this episode, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you. Make sure you like, subscribe, share it with someone you think might like this. You know, give a share, email, a text, press a little share button, however you want to do it. Share it with someone you think might enjoy hearing some great conversations about Catholic life. We got some great questions here today. A thousand great ones. Um, Before we get into it, I also want to say, if you want to reach out to me, ask me a question, or if you just want to have a conversation or think something we can talk about here on the podcast, yeah, reach out to me. Let me know. Text, email, comment, DM, however. I'm here for you. Let's get into these questions. Good first question here. First question. Is it true that God has a woman out there for me? I've been, told, I've been told my whole life that God has a girl out there for you. You just haven't found her yet. I'm almost 20 years old. And I haven't found her. I have some family members that have never found love. And they seem very sad and depressed about it. My greatest fear is being among them. I've never felt true love before. And I desire it so badly that I, to the point that I've become lustful. So is it true that God has a woman out there for me? Well, first of all, don't, don't, be, don't be lustful. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't start sinning because you're not getting what you want. Um, and I think, and you know, that's a serious note. Like if you are being led to sin by something, that's not from God. God's not saying, hey, there's no girl left for you, girl out there for you. So, you know, just be lustful, whatever. No, no, no. If your thoughts are leading you to sin, you got to switch it up. God's will for you is never to sin. So don't, don't do that. Don't be lustful. Um, you know, another point is I, I think really sensitive. This is a really sensitive topic for a lot of us Catholics. We know as Catholics, we get married on the younger side. You know, I'm sure many of you either got married young or know someone who's got married young. Um, you know, get married at 22, 23 is not that uncommon. Get married at 43. You might as well be like, you might as well just be going to the seminary if you haven't found a wife by 43. Maybe God's calling you to be a, a, a seminarian. Maybe God's calling you the priesthood. You know, it's a very sensitive topic for a lot of us. And I know all the gals out there, it's, you know, a hard topic to um, to think about, to, you know, it's discussed a lot, you know, finding a husband, finding a wife um, for, for us Catholics. So very sensitive topic. Um, and so I don't want to just say, I don't want to just offer any advice and say, hey, don't worry, just there is someone out there for you, your spouse out there for you. What I want to offer is a perspective on this, which is finding your spouse is part of your vocation, part of your vocation. And your vocation is part of serving God. So our vocation is directly linked to serving God. So don't take God out of finding a spouse. Don't take God out of it. Ask yourself, is it possible that God is preparing me for a great life and that he's working on me before he gives me what I want? Is God preparing me for a future season right now, but he's not giving me the thing that I want yet? So I want to have a girlfriend and I say I'm ready, but is it possible that God is doing a work in me to prepare me for when I do have the girlfriend? I want to be married, and I think I'm ready. I say I'm ready. But is it possible that God is doing a work in me and strengthening me and making me better and strengthening my foundation to prepare me for when I am in that season of having a wife? We ask God for things in our life. He's going to prepare us for those moments and those things that we're asked for and those seasons. But it's going to come with some trust. It's going to come with some patience. Because following God 
with our vocation. It's not just saying, hey, God, these are the things I want, so I'm going to go get them and just bless it because I'm holy. Thank you. Bye. That's not how it is. Everything is drawing us closer to God, including our vocation. We need God to take the lead in finding a husband or a wife because we need God to take the lead in being a husband and a wife. And we need God to take the lead in being a mother and a father. And we need God to take the lead of everything in our life. And if we don't trust God with the timing of having a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, and wife, how are we going to trust God with the timing of children? How are we going to trust God with the timing of getting a house? How are we going to trust God with the timing of giving to a community? How are we going to trust God with the timing of that new job? There's always something else we have to trust God with. And we have to keep God at the center of all of that. And and your vocation at the, from the very beginning is going to be a test of that. And I promise you that God has not forgotten about you. God hasn't been like, oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. There's, there's not enough girls for this guy. Oh, no. Ran out of good girls. Now, I don't know everyone's story. And again, I know this is sensitive. I'm not going to say, hey, just wait. It'll come. But I promise you God has not forgotten about you. And I don't know where that's going to take you. I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to be. It's, if you're, it's, it's not always going to be your exact time to know. I, you know, for myself, I live in a state I did not grow up in. I live 2,000 miles from where I grew up in. The state of what I grew up in person that was put in my life, producer Tanya, we all know and love her, is from Texas. Well, when we really started seriously dating and when we were long distance, that thought came to my head, am I willing to not live in the East Coast? And, you know, I wrestled with that question, but following my vocation took me out of all of my comfort zone of where I lived. I would have never thought that I'd be living here the rest of my life, raising kids here. But this is where God has me. So, I, so I'm, I'm peaceful about that. I know that's where God brought us. This is where God has us. So I can trust in his plan. Not to say there's a bumps along the road, but um, yeah, God is preparing you for the next season right now. The things that you want in the next season, God's preparing you right now. So trusting in God's timing is always going to be a part of our decision-making process and always part of our vocation from here on out. And God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Don't despair. Um, be open to where God is going to bring you with your vocation because um, he hasn't forgotten about you. Good question. Classic question. We needed to, we need to talk about it. Next question. Is there a dress code for church? I started going to church within last year. Originally, I was going by myself until I told my grandma, to which she said, I would love to come with you. She doesn't drive, so I drive us to Mass every Sunday. The first time we went together, she made a rather harsh comment about my choice of clothing. I was wearing t-shirt and shorts, something I wear literally every day. She said it's disrespectful to wear in a house of God. I'm just wondering if my grandma is right, if we have to get dressed up for church. Is it a doctrine to wear nice clothes at church? Is it a requirement? Age old question. Can you wear shorts to mass? If you're at a beach town in New Jersey during the summer, yeah, that's where everyone, you know, everyone wears shorts. Everyone's just a little bit more laid back. You can wear shorts. You know, I've, I, I've, I've had some evolution on that of like, hey, well, how dressed up do you have to be? Now, I think there's two things. Because I'm with you, bro. Like, you know, my, my inclination, I will show up in shorts and a t-shirt. I'm here. My heart is here, you know? Is that good enough? Is it not good enough? But here's where I've kind of landed on this. Like, how, how dressed up do you have to get to mass? Can you wear shorts to mass? First and foremost, it is more important that we come prepared internally more than externally. I know this is not the, you know, uh, tried and true Vatican answer, but it is more important that our internal is more is prepared more than our external. Um... You know, if you get dressed up and you wear a suit and tie to mass and you got mortal sin all over your soul, 
is the suit and tie really helping you? You know what I mean? We have to make sure our internal is is good. So this is not an either or situation. It's not just, hey, well, my internal is good, so now it's all good. Now, where I've had some evolution on this is, you know, okay, do I need to wear a suit and tie? No, you don't have to. It's not a requirement. You don't have to wear a suit and tie. But I always say, am, if I, like, I wore this to work today, this college shirt. So if I wear this to work, showing some level of professionalism, but I don't want to wear it to mass, where it is a safer place, where there is a showing up, where there is a presenting yourself to the Lord. It's not just like you don't just drive by your car to mass. You go, you present, you bring your family, you go, you know. If I bring this to, to work, but I don't wear it to mass, like, why? Why do I feel like I should get more dressed up for work rather than mass? Why do I feel like I should get dressed up for work? Oh, professionalism. Oh, well, because well, in some way, maybe I feel like it benefits me to present professionally, but it doesn't be- benefit me to present dressed up at bass. So I think I kind of have to be honest with myself about like, well, if I'm wearing something, you know, a nice shirt to work, if I wear a nice shirt to meet up with friends, shouldn't I also then wear even a nice shirt to, to church? So where I've tried to land on is like wear nice pants or jeans and a college shirt. Um, you know, can you wear shorts? You know, Texas, it's really, really hot here. I mean, yeah, I feel like if you had a nice pair of shorts on, a nice polo, like, yeah, you could wear that. But I think only you know maybe the standard of how you're presenting yourself to God. So look at, you know, I'd be honest with myself. Like, well, if I'm wearing a ripped t-shirt that I'm wearing to a bar, but then the next day I'm going to work and I'm wearing a college shirt, maybe I should should raise my own standard, you know, of where I'm wearing, where I'm wearing college shirts to. So I would say, think about it, pray about it, try wearing a college shirt, see how it feels. You know, start with that, start with a college shirt and jeans and just, you know, bring yourself to level up a little bit. Just level yourself up because, you know, like actually when we level ourselves up and bring our dress up a little bit, it helps us be set apart. It, like it's a, it's different. Like it's not just a bar. So a way to do that is by dressing up a little bit. So again, I'm not, I'm never going to be one to say, hey, you need to wear a suit and tie to mass every Sunday. I'm sorry. I'm never going to do it. But wear a nice college shirt, nice pair of pants, jeans, you know, nice sneakers or nice boots. That's a good place, I think, to land. Good, a good meeting ground. And then if you feel called to wear a suit and tie, go for it. Go for it. Okay, next question is a good one. What advice would you give to a 25-year-old? Little background info on me. I'm a 25-year-old male. I'm entering catechumen soon. Congratulations. Going back to college and searching for a wife. What advice would you give to your 25-year-old self or advice that would help me out at 25? I think at 25... The questions about life, the bigger questions about life really start to kick in. Where am I going to be? Where am I going to find a husband or wife? What is my job going to be? What's my career? Do I like this career? Should I get a new career? There's a lot of questions, a lot of adult questions. How do I do this? How do I pay taxes? Should I get a new car? Should I move to this city? Should I take that job? There's so many questions at 25. There's so many big life questions that you're kind of dealing with. So I'll just say, you don't have to all have it all figured out. You have your opportunity now to go take some risks, take that job, go overseas, um, you know, get that apartment with your friends, work hard, ask the girl out on a date, you know, learn a new skill, try to meet new people, take the risks at 25. It's a great time to take some risks. Um, yeah, you don't have to have it all figured out. I mean, I remember when I was 25, definitely feeling like a lot of transition. I spent a couple of years as a missionary. I was working for a nonprofit. I didn't really know if I wanted to keep doing stuff in that world or start a different career or where I was going to end up. I had a lot of questions. Um, I didn't know like where I wa- I didn't know where I fit in to like this post school college, this post, you know, 
I'm not in school in student life. Taking risks that maybe God was calling me to worked out as opposed to just staying in my comfort zone and doing everything in my comfort zone um, that I want. So, you know, the advice is God is going to call you to places maybe be open to those risks. Um, you definitely should learn some skills. You definitely should be open. Just be open. I think being open is a great perspective and point of view to have as a 25-year-old. Be open to where God is bringing you. Um, so great question. I like that. I resonated with that. I remember that age. So final question for today. Kind of a longer question. I'm going to try to blast through it, but I think it's very, very important and a great question. Question. When is it appropriate to speak out against evil? I don't want to give too many details, but here's the basic situation. My husband is an attorney who my husband is an attorney who clerks for a judge. We occasionally have to attend dinners um, by community elites in our city. It's not uncommon at these events, the dinner table, to have conversations veered towards things about religious people or pro-life or anyone who op opposes uh, contemporary ethics. There's a sneering contempt for those affirming uh, the long-standing orthodoxies of our tr tradition. In the past, I've kept my head down and just been trying not to affirm anything they, anything awful they say. It's very uncomfortable. Somehow the venue doesn't seem appropriate for a pro-life debate, nor an Old Testament prophet-style verbal rebuke. But I also remember stories of saints of the early church, many of whom came from nobility and stood up against the evil paganism of their times. My husband and I are so confused about the line between humility and cowardice. On the one hand, we don't want to be awful dinner guests and humiliate the host or anyone in attendance, but at one point, are we just trying to save our own faces by keeping quiet? Oh my gosh. Wow, this is such a good question. I think this is like one of the top questions that a lot of us Catholics deal with here in America, which is like, when do we speak up against people making fun of Jesus, making fun of our faith? When do we speak up against people who are, you know, promoting evil in the world? Because we know it is open season for Catholics. The elites of the world have the freedom, they feel the freedom to mock Christianity, mock Jesus with no consequences. It doesn't matter the TV show, the movie, the program, it doesn't matter what, as you turn on the TV, anyone on there could be making fun of Jesus and they feel the freedom like, ah, oh, I can do this. You. you know, you see it. You, it doesn't matter what it is. People feel absolutely open and free to just mock Jesus, mock Christianity, mock Catholic beliefs. They're, they they do not think there are any consequences. And you know it. You turn, you know when you turn, there it is again. They're mocking Jesus. There it is again. They're mocking Catholic life. There it is again. They're mocking the Catholic Church. You know, there there is this podcast again. Someone being like, actually, do you know, uh, you know, the Catholic Church is responsible for this much, you know, you know, destruction. It's like, okay, yeah, like people feel absolutely free to mock the church, talk about evils in the world, and not and not even hear a perspective of like the Christian. So, what do we do about it? How do we speak about this? Well. First and foremost, you know, my perspective is this, like, do you, well, for, follow your conscience, what you think is best. But here's where my uh, perspective I offer. Our words are like the least powerful tool that we can use to change someone's heart or change someone's mind or be a witness. You know, our words are not the greatest tool. So if our first instinct is always to like, hey, how do I combat this with my mouth? You know, it's not always the greatest way to do that. You know, I, I, last week we talked about, I like, hey, no one's given their life to Jesus over an Instagram comment. No one's had their mind changed over an Instagram comment section. You know, you can get in there. You can start preaching the faith. You could spend time writing comments. You know, you can. That, that's great. And people are going to do it. But, you know, not many people's lives are going to be changed or minds are going to be changed over an Instagram comment. So, for example, at a dinner party, I don't think having a debate about some stuff is going to change anyone's minds. So, is that the right place? I don't know. Now, that doesn't mean you have to engage. I think 
You should have every free right to not engage. You don't have to sit there. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, ever. You can get up and walk away. You can take your, your drink and your shrimp cocktail and walk away. You do not have to engage. You can look unengaged. You do not have to engage with people speaking out about, you know, the evils of the world. It's also the long game, too. Like, we plant the seeds. God does the watering and God does the growing. We don't know what seeds are going to be planted at when we leave an interaction. So treat everyone with, treat everyone with love. Treat everyone with dignity. If you feel like it's not a place for debate, okay. If you feel like there's a private one-on-one conversation that's happening, okay. You share your perspective, okay. If you feel like it's getting heated and you don't think that's the time, okay. You know, use your conscience. But we don't know what seeds are going to be watered when we leave. So, you know, treating people with kindness, treating people with love, being respectful, being attentive, sharing your story, sharing your perspective on life, you know, saying, saying, being positive, that will help be a witness. You know, that's like the, the, the secondary thing, not like, you know, debates, maybe aren't as, debates maybe aren't a great witness, but maybe a great witness is the stuff that we think we don't think of being positive, talking positively, having a, you know, uh, you know, having a perspective that's not like negative about family life or negative about work, like that's going to stand out. Play the long game, plant the seeds, be relational, treat them with love, be humble, let God do the rest. There's going to be opportunities to evangelize when we just follow God because we live in such a broken world that people need it and those doors will open and pray to God for the vision to see when you need to walk through that door and the courage to walk through that door to share about the good news of the gospel, share about Jesus, invite people into a relationship with Jesus at the right time. So great question, tough question, really good to think about. I'd love to hear your guys' perspective. Tell me what you think about, um, you know, when to speak up, when not to speak up. How do you know, how do we speak up about evils? How do we speak about mockery of the church? When do we do it? Um, because I know that this is just come on my perspective and I'm, thinking more of like a dinner table scenario. Um, I might have some blind spots where, you know, like, I don't know. Just tell me what you think. I'd love to hear your perspective on when is the right time to speak up, um, you know, for our faith. So that's going to be it for me today, y'all. I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for checking in. Make sure you like, subscribe, share this episode with someone, share with one person you think would benefit from hearing about this. Um, As always, thank you so much for, uh, listening and watching. Appreciate y'all so much. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.